This morning I'd like to speak to you from the Old Testament reading from Ecclesiastes 3 verses 1 to 13. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Gracious Lord, indeed the times and seasons are in your hands. Help us this morning to learn to live in these times and seasons from eternity so that we might praise your glorious name and live peacefully on this earth. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Many of you probably enjoyed the New Year's Eve fireworks last night. Some may be live at Mooloola Bar, others on um, telly as you watch the ABC from Sydney. One of the most memorable fireworks displays happened in Sydney on December the 31st, 1999. It was the eve of the 21st century, the dawn of the third millennium. And at 10 seconds to midnight, <clears throat> the countdown began. Then as the new millennium arrived, there was a massive fireworks display that lasted some 24 minutes. And at the end, uh, a fiery cascade erupted <clears throat> near the harbour bridge. And then once all the dust settled, it came into view, emblazoned in gold on the top of the Sydney Harbour Bridge, the first written word of the third millennium in familiar copper plate was the word eternity. The crowds cheered wildly. This was a word deeply and affectionately associated with the history of Sydney and with one man in particular, Arthur Stace. He was not the first person to write eternity around Sydney, but he was certainly the most prolific. He did it using chalk or crayon every day for some 35 years, perhaps writing eternity for some half a million times in all. Now, Stace had died 32 years before the firework display, but he was far from forgotten. In fact, because of this New Year's Eve fireworks display and the tribute, all of Australia was to discover the story of Arthur Stace. Now, Arthur Stace was a former soldier, petty criminal, and severe alcoholic, even drinking metho. He became a devout Christian on Wednesday, the August the 6th, 1930. With a group of his alcoholic mates, he attended a meeting at St. Barnabas Anglican Church in Sydney, run by the Archdeacon RPS Hammond for down and out men. There are about 300 there that night, and most of those men, like, Ham like uh, Stace, were there for the free cuppa and the rock cake that you got at the end of the night. But Stace got something more than a rock cake that night. He got the rock, Jesus Christ. He knew he had taken that leap of faith that Hammond invited the men to take because he felt that he immediately lost the urge to drink. And then as time went on to gamble, to swear, and to blaspheme. And in the 1930s, he heard a sermon by the evangelist John Ridley tell a congregation in the Burton Street Baptist Tabernacle in Sydney that he wished he could shout eternity through all the streets of Sydney. <clears throat> Stace felt inspired. He said, I felt a powerful call from the Lord to write eternity. So he did for the next almost 35 years around Sydney. And that itself was a miracle because Stace could barely read or write. Ridley was a fiery evangelist. No doubt his sermon that night called Echoes of Eternity was full of evangelistic zeal in order to get people to believe in Jesus Christ as their Saviour and find their way to eternity 
to live in heaven forever with their God when they died. And indeed, when we think about eternity, that is what we think about it as being something we participate in the future, either something to do with heaven or with eternal life to come. But in our text from Ecclesiastes, the author who calls himself the teacher in Ecclesiastes 1 verse 1 says, he, that's God, has also set eternity in the hearts of men, men and women, that is. Eternity is with us. We don't live towards eternity or for eternity. We live from eternity. And as we begin this new year of 2023, that's what I'd like to speak to you today about, living from eternity. God has set eternity in the hearts of people. What does that mean? Well, it's saying that God has put something in our hearts that longs for more than this life. The proper response to the question of, is this life all there is, is no. Because God has prepared something for us beyond the short years of our lives here. And he has put within us a longing for that life that is not bookended by birth and death. Eternity is not something, though, that only transcends time and space. It also embraces time and space in all its fullness. As according to Jewish thinking, eternity was time as far back as you could think and as far forward as you could go. It's true that for all generations of humanity, no matter how far back you go and how far forward you go. As you live from eternity on this earth, you live within the times and seasons under heaven. Eternity is not up there in the clouds, but it's down here on the earth and in the human heart. And as such, it embraces all of life. Now, in Ecclesiastes 3, 1 to 8, we are given one of the most comprehensive summaries of the rhythms of life. All of the 28 seasons that are listed uh, have been, uh, what has been and what will be common to all humanity, no, and what it means to live life in this world, from its very creation to its very end. All of these things listed are common to all people, no matter what race, gender, caste, or creed. Many people think Ecclesiastes is a book of gloom and pessimism because on the level of the writer's limitations, which he says are under the sun or under heaven, the visible things of life, if his findings are gloomy and pessimistic. In fact, at the beginning of Ecclesiastes, he says, meaningless, meaningless, utterly meaningless, everything is meaningless. But that is not the message of the book because God intends us to have joy and his program to bring it about includes living under all these opposites as we proceed through life in this world. If you look carefully, you will see that these eight opening verses gather around three major themes which correspond to the major divisions of a person, body, soul, and spirit. The first four pairs deal with the body. Birth, death, plant, uproot, kill, heal, tear down, build. All of these apply to the physical life. So let's just take a look at two of these pairs of opposites. Firstly, life and death. None of us asked to be born. It happened to us. It was done to us, apart from us. None of us also asked to die. It's something done to us by God in his wisdom. So that is the way we should view this list of opposites. As a lift of what God thinks 
we ought to have as those created in his image. And it begins by pairing birth and death as the boundaries of life under heaven. There's also a time to kill and a time to heal. That may sound strange to us, but the process of dying goes right along beside the process of living. Doctors tell us that every seven years, the cells in our bodies die, but our bodies do not die. What you are now is not what you were seven years ago, yet you are the same. How can we understand the fact that each cell seems to pass on to the cell which replaces it, the memory of the past, so that even though our brain cells have changed, the memory goes back beyond the life of the cell itself. We can't understand this wisdom. Nonetheless, there is a time to kill and a time to heal in life, and God brings it to pass. Then the teacher moves into the realm of the soul with its functions of thinking, feeling, and choosing the social areas and all of the interrelationships of life that flow from that. Firstly, weeping, laughing, mourning, and dancing. All of these things follow closely and they're appropriate. No one is going to escape the hurts and sorrows of this life. God chooses them for us. And the proof of that is when God's own son came, Jesus Christ, he was not handed a beautiful life with everything pleasant and easy and delightful, free from struggle and pain. No, in Isaiah, he's predicted as being the man of sorrows acquainted with grief. In this fallen world, it follows that there will be times of hurt and sorrow and weeping. But then there will also be times when it's right to laugh, to be happy, and to be carefree. There is a time of grief and tears, a time to mourn, but there's also a time to celebrate and enjoy and be happy and be pleased with life. And then there's a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones. There's a time to actually break things down and a time to build them up again. And this particularly has to do with our social structures, with our relationships with others. There's a time when we need to embrace others to show our support for them. But there's a time when we also need to refuse to embrace them, when our support could be misunderstood and would be tantamount to complicity with something evil. The last six of these opposites then relate to the spirit, to the inner decisions, to the deep commitments. So I just want to take a look at three of these pairs here. Firstly, there is a time to be silent and a time to speak. There are times when we know something, a, a piece of gossip, and we should not say it. We ought not to speak. And then there are times when we ought to speak. When something we are keeping secret would bring truth into a situation, it's time to speak up. There's also a time to love and to hate. When it's time to hate, well, it's often in the face of injustice. Young Abraham Lincoln, it is said, the first time he saw human beings sold into slavery in the markets at New Orleans, felt hatred rising in his heart. And he resolved that if he ever got the chance to smash slavery, he would do so. Lincoln's hatred of slavery was perfectly appropriate. And so there's also a time to love. A time when it is right, when we should extend our love to others and to somebody. Especially somebody who is hurting and someone who's feeling dejected, rejected, lonely or weak. We share them love in order to heal and to build them up. And then there's a time for war and a time for peace. We ought to remember this as we consider 
the issues before us today. When tyranny rides a roughshod over the rights of people, there's a time, a proper time, when nations need to rise up and defend themselves in war. But there's a, also a time when war is absolutely wrong, when no provocation should be allowed to start a war because war can explode into violence far beyond anything demanded by a particular situation. Now, as we think back over all of these opposites, we acknowledge that they are part of God's plan for life. The problem, though, is that they're not part of our plans for life because if we were given that right, we would have no unpleasantness in life at all, would we? We would make life smooth sailing for ourselves. But that would ruin us. Because God knows that people who are protected from everything almost invariably end up being impossible to live with. They can become selfish and cruel and vicious and shallow and unprincipled. And God sends us these opposites in order that we might be taught that there is a time for everything, says the teacher. But more than that, if God has a time for everything, he also has a purpose in everything. And that's what the teacher declares in verse 9. What does the worker gain from his toil? What is left over to provide a permanent sense of satisfaction after the momentary pleasure is extracted from some pleasurable experience? Well, that is the question which with the teacher examines everything. And life itself is going to hide the secret. And the purpose of all these things is to be found by careful, thoughtful examination. And so he gives us the answer. And he gives us three things. Firstly, that he, God, has made everything beautiful in its time. Everything is appropriate and helpful to us. What appears to be the negative as well as the possible, good can come out of bad. It is possible, even though it may be hard or actually impossible for us to fathom. The second thing the teacher learned in his search is, as we have already said, he has also set eternity in the hearts of men. There's a quality about life in humanity that can never be explained by the rationale of science. No animal is ever restless and dissatisfied when its physical needs have been met. Think about the well-fed dog sleeping before the fire on a cold day. He's with his family, enjoying himself, not worried about anything. He could just stay there all day. I put a man in that position and pretty soon he'll see it, feel a sense of restlessness. There's something beyond, something more that he's crying out for. And this endless search for an answer beyond what we can feel or sense in our physical and emotional needs is what is here called eternity in man's heart. St. Augustine said, Thou hast made us for thyself and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in thee. Man is the only worshipping animal. What makes him different cannot be explained by scientific knowledge. He is different because he longs for the God in whose image he is made. The third thing which the teacher learned is that mystery remains. He says, yet they cannot fathom what God has done from beginning to the end. We're growing in our knowledge, but we discover as we grow that the more we know, the more we yet need to learn. The increase of knowledge only increases the depth of wonder and of delight. In the sovereign wisdom of God, we cannot solve all mysteries. We cannot fathom all the highs and lows of life, only live it. And this is why the exhortation of Scripture is always 
that we must trust the revelation of the Father's wisdom in areas we cannot understand. Jesus said over and over again that the life of faith is like that of a little child. A little child in his father's arms is unaware of many things that his father has learned. But resting in his father's arms, he's quite content to let those enigmas unfold as he grows, trusting in the wisdom of his father. That is the life of faith. And that is what we are to do in our experience. Finally, in verses 12 and 13, the teacher teaches us how to live in this world of opposites. First, he says, I know that there is nothing better for men than to be happy and do good while they live. You know, everybody agrees with that. Even the commercials on TV and in the magazines tell us that. Live life with gusto. You only go around once. Seize it now, and, but just be a good person as you do it. All right, the teacher says, way to go. And secondly, he says that everyone may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all his toil. This is the gift from God. Underline those words, find satisfaction. This is what the teacher finds that man cannot produce. Things in themselves give a momentary, not a lasting satisfaction. True enjoyment is a gift from God. It is what God wants, and that's what the teacher has been arguing about all along. It is what comes from living from eternity in your hearts. So, my friends, to conclude, 2023 will be more of the same for all of us. There will be good health and sickness, war and peace, birth and death, success and failure, hellos and goodbyes, smiles and sadness, hope and despair, goodwill and hostility. As the teacher says in Ecclesiastes 1.9, there is nothing new under the sun. But also this is true. God has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the hearts of men. So live from eternity in this beautiful world, never forgetting that even in the hard times, the hard times of trial, God is shaping, moulding and growing us. So be, so be happy, do good and find satisfaction in all that comes your way in 2023. It is the gift of God to you. Live from eternity, for God has placed eternity in your hearts. Amen. So, Lord, we thank you for the wonderful gift of eternity that you have placed in our hearts as we go through the ups and downs of 2023. Be with us. May we know your presence. May we know, may know most of all eternity in our hearts, that while we are here, there is something greater. And while we are here, we have that greater one within us to live life in peace and joy. In your precious name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen.